Thank you, Adam. Now I have all the pressure on me to run the session. So um, good afternoon, good day, good morning, or howdy, y'all, to some of you where I'm from. Um, as the uh, sign says, I'm Michael Lewis. My former title was Policy and Framework Advisor at Chevron. Now I have an even longer one of Cybersecurity and Technology Strategy Planner. I guess the next title will be even longer than that. Uh, so as, as Adam said, this panel is on cybersecurity. What I'm going to do is have the panelists briefly introduce themselves over the next five or so minutes. Uh, then we do have some questions to run through. Um, and again, those of you in the audience, if you do have questions of your own for the panel, please feel free to put them into chat. Uh, assuming my um, education here in Houston will allow me to read the English and make the questions out, uh, we'll be able to get those to the panelists. So, Christine, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and we'll walk through the panelists here. Yeah, hi all. Um, great to see you. My name is Christine Theodorsen. I work in Equinor. And Equinor is a broad energy company leveraging strong synergies between oil, gas, renewables, and carbon capture and hydrogen. I have about 15 years of experience from the energy industry, and I've been 10 years in Equinor. I worked in several positions, um, mainly within change management, and I also had a role within strategy for Equinor's CIO. Uh, currently, I'm heading up a company-wide change project in IT security and change management and competence, uh, where the aim is to have all leaders and employees in Equinor to better understand the risks and opportunities related to the energy transition and cybersecurity. Uh, a passion that I also have is diversity and inclusion, and I have for the past four years started an internal community consisting of more than 1,500 employees to emphasize the need for a broader talent pool in the industry and within technology. I'm very excited to be here today, and thank you so much for the invite. Thank you, Christine. Peter, why don't you go next? Yeah, thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, thank you, Christine. Um, so, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Piotr Cipiela. I'm a, I'm a partner in a global cyber architecture, engineering, and emerging tech leader at EY, so a consultancy company. Um, on the daily basis, I'm connecting technology with cyber. Uh, my main focus is critical infrastructure protection. Um, actually, I wrote a book about uh, industrial control system protection in the context of critical infrastructure. And apart from it, of course, in my responsibilities, there are emerging technologies like IoT or uh, cloud. I can proudly say that I have contributed to many of, of our global standards. You probably know them all. Um, for instance, I'm a, a global voting member for International Society of Automation, but also I have contributed to US standards, European Union standards, and, and, and some Asian um, standards as well. Um, and before COVID, I had privileged actually to, uh, to live in some of those locations. Um, today, I'm supporting C-level executives with what is going on in the world, what are the trends, how actually uh, effectively implement, design, shape cyber and tech agenda. So hopefully today we'll do the same. I look forward for this session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shauro. Why don't you come go next? Uh, hi, everybody. And my name is uh, Shauro Abdul Rashid. I'm from Petronas. Uh, I am Group Technical Authority, uh, Instrumentation and Control uh, Custodian. Uh, in uh, I've been in Petronas for the past uh, 30 years, uh, since from Transmission Operation Division for 10 years, then liquefied natural gas another 10 years, then to refinery and petrochemical another 10 years. And now I'm in the corporate uh, center uh, advising a petronas why in terms of uh, instrumentation control that covers uh, cyber security. Right now I'm leading the team for the deployment of uh, real-time OT uh, cyber security tools, uh, AV and patching system, automation system, an OT monitoring system, um, and also I am uh, now right now I'm the vice chair for the IEC GCA, IEC International Society of Automation Global uh, Cybersecurity Alliance. I'm the vice chair, and I'm, I'm also the uh, IEC president uh, Malaysia, and also the um, co-chair for the certification work group out open process automation. Back to you, uh, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. And last but certainly not least is Matt. 
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Matt Leipnick. I'm the uh, lead industrial cybersecurity specialist for Baker Hughes. Uh, Baker Hughes is an energy technology company, um, historically part of, of what was GE Oil and Gas. And my role is, uh, and I do a number of things in my role, but the core of it is probably best described as um, solution architecture and operations for uh, industrial cybersecurity solutions. Uh, I've been with the company about three years, um, 20 years in uh, cyber security, the last six in industrial. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And so we'll now get into the questions. Again, those of you in the audience are watching uh, this particular presentation. Uh, please feel free to have, have questions for any of our esteemed call or panelists. Please drop them into the chat and we will get to them as we can during the session. Uh, but to start off the session, uh, cybersecurity, as you might have guessed, is a somewhat complex topic. And to mitigate risks, one needs to be able to think broadly. Um, and one way to do this is a diverse works, workforce. Uh, but there's also a extreme shortage of cybersecurity professionals. So there was a study done by I ISC Squared last year that estimated the shortfall is somewhere around 3.12 million cybersecurity professionals. So the first couple of questions to y'all is to what steps are your companies taking to ensure that you have a diverse cybersecurity workforce? And then how are you addressing your cybersecurity workforce needs in light of the shortage of qualified professionals? So Christine, why don't you kick off the conversation with this one? Yeah, and this is, um, thank you for that, because this is sort of my two passions hand in hand. And and with diversity, um, how we go about that in, in a general basis in Equinor is that we have to have inclusion. So diversity in itself doesn't ensure that we extract the value for it, from it. So, but diversity and inclusion, and including in this case, uh, cybersecurity in a day-to-day -day work um, and ensuring um, security by design, uh, that's important for us. Uh, also very passionate about um, the broader thoughts on this one, uh, because we're all sort of competing for the same talents here. So I want to pass this one on to, to more of you also. Any, any of the others want to jump in on this one? Uh, yeah, sure, if, if, if I may. I mean, this is very important and difficult, let's say, topic. But also, I think it's a business topic. It's a business topic because we are not able to fulfill our requirements. We're not able to align with our regulations when we don't have um, a, a, you know, right SME in place. and. It's, it's, it is there in the short supplies, right? So, I mean, EY has actually created a lot of different initiatives. Um, I think two of them are very uh, important and, and, and very relevant for this panel. Um, one, I think, very obvious, and I think should be natural. And the second may be uh, a little bit new, but I would encourage everyone to take this into consideration. So the first one, of course, is uh, woman in technology. Uh, and Christine, it's great that we have you over here, but we all know that still we need more and more women in the uh, tech organizations, right? It is something that uh, we are seeing that globally workforce is half and half, right? Uh, but in terms of, of uh, technology, um, cyber, we are seeing that less than a quarter of, of the jobs is with, with um, women. And when we are looking at the, uh, and the number of women that are going to study STEM, some science, technology, engineering, and the mathematics, where we are having like majority of people from, um, it's, it's going to be even worse. Um, so the first thing we have uh, put as a part in, in one of women in technology is we, we created the UI STEM tribe app. So this is application basically uh, targeted for uh, girls age 13 to 18. So just before the college. Um, and basically the reason for that is, is uh, to encourage them to study STEM, right? So science and, and you know, among others, cybersecurity. Now over there, it's like, you know, it's a co-op, you have a gamification, you have uh, right now in the pilot, we have more than 3,000 3, girls from Delhi, Seattle, Atlanta, like across the globe. And they are basically answering some questions. They are like, going through a uh, NASA question, National Academy of, of Science and so on and so forth about cybersecurity, black, black blockchain and you know, emerging technologies. Um, more than 98%, uh, you know, are very happy with that. Um, and I think this is, this is uh, moving us in the, in the right direction, not only let's say today, but we're looking for the, for the future development. Uh, by 
20, by the end of next year, we want to ha we'll have 100,000 girls in that program. So like, this is one of the things we want to do. But the second, and I think, uh, you know, very important for, for, for me as well, is uh, neurodiversity. And, and this is still, uh, unfortunately, still a new topic. Uh, when we are talking about neurodiversity, it's like I'm sometimes coming uh, um, Newtons of, of today's world, right? So like, you know, that like, uh, Mozart, Einstein, Newton, they were all um, uh, with Asperger's syndrome. So like uh, they were part of uh, neurodiverse um, society. We are putting, let's say, uh, a lot of effort to attract those talents. And we think this is absolutely uh, great. And I would, I would stress this out. This is a very business, uh, let's say, oriented um, uh, initiative. So we have launched this five years ago as a pilot. Like we needed to learn ourselves, right? So we needed to completely redesign our uh, recruitment process, our like uh, um, tools and so on and so forth. But we gained really great employees, very, very smart. Sometimes very, you know, like simple things um, uh, needed to, to make them comfortable, like, you know, like, different shade, maybe different, you know, silent room, and so on and so forth. But now it's great. We are launching, uh, actually, the Neurodiversity uh, Center of Excellence across the globe. And I think what can encourage you is that, apart from really great employees you may get, is that retention rate is today at the 92%. And, uh, like, cybersecurity is the, usually the first area we, we, um, we have volunteers. Um, so basically, I think this is a very important one to take into consideration, in, especially in these this very difficult times. Thank you. Thank you. Sharol, Matt, anything to add? I'd, um, I'd have to agree regards the um, education piece. So STEM initiatives is one of the things that we're doing. And I think trying to work at like a grass, grassroots level, trying to make cybersecurity and technology uh, and engineering disciplines attractive uh, for people to apply to. Um, one other thing, I, I, other thing I wanted to share, something that's worked quite well for us, is um, we have um, diversity inclusion as part of our learning and development culture. So we have a number of different um, employer resource groups that are also responsible for um, education and teaching initiatives amongst like the broader workforce. So it's it's part of um, culture and learning as opposed to setting up. Uh, some diversity groups and just sort of uh, pigeonholing just to that activity, whereas trying to make it, even though you've got these groups, that they're not siloed groups, that they're part of our, uh, you know, learning, development, hiring process anyway, and they're, they're very active and create some quite good community type um, culture based stuff for us. So I just wanted to, that's been useful for us. Cheryl? Okay, um, I'm just uh, sharing my context when I try to deploy the cybersecurity project. We face, uh, uh, we don't have enough experienced people to uh, supervise and con monitor the projects done by our contractors. So I do it innovatively. I have this uh, telecommunication group. I am from instrument, con instrument control group. Instrument control normally, they take, they are actually the custodian for these cybersecurity matters for the OT's, uh, OT side. Huh? So I, I, I retool the telecommunication group so that they, they, they also come to, to help us, assist us in this uh, aspect. Thank you. So I'll throw in about three things that we do too. I, I know I'm not a panelist, but I'll take advantage of the fact that I have a microphone. Uh, one of the things that we do um, in trying to get a pipeline of talent coming to us is work with uh, some of the local universities uh, so we will provide them funding to help them build their programs out for cybersecurity and then provide uh, positions for interns or others who can come over. And we've hired a number of folks through that particular channel, getting them a better education than they might have gotten otherwise because of our funding and also getting a good employee back that way as well. Um, another thing that we're doing internally is automation. Um, seems odd that a technology can solve the employment issue, but if we're able to automate a lot of the manual tasks that take a lot of time and don't provide a whole lot of value, we can take the uh, experienced and trained personnel and move them to other tasks, which allow them to provide greater value to the company. And the other thing that we talk about going to the neurodiversity area that uh, Piotr mentioned would be uh, job paths. Uh, so I know when I started the Chevron, 
um, way back in the last century. I won't give you how many years I've actually been at Chevron. Um, the idea was that if you were a really good technical person, you should be a manager. Um, and we'll leave aside the lack of logic from that particular path. But basically, the only way to get ahead in the company was to become a manager. Um, and some of the folks who are in the neurodiversity areas, that's probably the worst thing you could do to them uh, because they are very good at doing specific tasks, very good specialists. If you keep them in that role, they will be extremely good employees. But if you force them to do something out of their comfort zone, that's going to cause all sorts of issues. And so what you need, one of the things that might help to keep retain folks um, is to make sure you have paths for people to go different places. So you, know, you can have a technical management paths, so that's fine. But make sure you have technical paths so that if someone gets a job, there are places that they can move up in the world uh, by doing the tasks that they're really, really good at. And that can help keep those folks around, help keep a much better diverse workforce. So excellent job on that particular question. Again, those in the audience, if you have questions, please drop them in the trap, into the, into the trap. If you drop in the trap, we won't find them at all. But if you drop in the chat, you might actually read them. Um, our second question, um, this may not apply to any of us on here because I'm sure all of you have unlimited budgets for cybersecurity and you can spend your money everywhere you want. Is that correct? I see a bunch of blank stares. When, when, I, when, I, when I'm asleep and, and dreaming, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. You, you have some interesting dreams, but we won't go there for on the panel. So how do you prioritize? So obviously you're going to have to watch what you spend. So how do you, what do you do to prioritize the monies that you have? to get the biggest bang for your buck for cyber investments? And what tools do you use to make those decisions? So I'll make this a free for all toss up. Whoever wants to jump in first is more than welcome to do so. Go on, and if I'll no one has that. any tools, this will be a very quick question. So, yeah, I um, can go ahead, Matt, yeah, that's okay. Go on, no, go, after, yeah, go on. Yeah, it's, it's a big question and, and in terms of, um, uh, as been said already, we're in the same market um, in the world for talent. But um, in order to sort of um, go back to the basis, um, I have a term wh which I called, um, you have to protect your crown jewels and, and know what they are. And, and, and then you can build your competence around that. Um, and and um, when you do so, when you understand uh, sort of what competence you really need to have and, and try to distinguish what, what it, it's hard to say in cybersecurity what's the need to have and, and must have. But in this sort of global shortage of competence, you still need to do that exercise and, and protect your core um, values and assets. And, and when you do so, you can be risk-based and, and um, systematically work on this uh, in a structured manner to protect whatever is defined as the core uh, of the company. Um, that, at least that's my thinking. Very curious on this as well. Matt, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, similar to what you sort of said, really. I, I, it depends where you are in your journey as well. So. Um, more established companies are looking to do more advanced things around cyber. I kind of break it up into three areas. Um, I call it hygiene, hybrid, and holistic. So hygiene is the, ba the basics, like Christine was talking about. Um, uh, hybrid is kind of bringing and introducing sort of visibility tools into your environment. And holistic is moving towards that, that risk-based uh, kind of approach. And that really also sort of sets out how you mature you are in your capability because if, if you've not done the fundamentals then you can't move on to doing um, some of the proactive stuff so it's a move from reactive to proactive really um, my top three if you like um, I think if you're limited on funds um, I think looking at backup first while you work out what you have um, because projects take time to implement and something's going to happen while you're trying to roll some of this stuff out and worst case scenario, you're going to need your backup and you need to make sure that you have it and, and that it's not going to get encrypted by ransomware as well as everything else. Um, the next piece is kind of visibility. Um, so knowing what you have, what's going on in your environment. And then the third one um, is probably thinking about what happens in these worst case scenarios. So, And this one's really free, I suppose. If you sit down in a room with um, key people in your organization, do a tabletop exercise, you know, what happens if this happens? Who's responsible? Who's who's next in the chain to deal with this problem when when this occurs? And start thinking through some of this stuff. 
and then try, trying to work out where where you have holes in that and that will help you work out where to where to spend your money uh, and then there's obviously some more advanced stuff which i think i'm going to cover in another another topic but those are my my highlights okay Piotr or Chirul, Chirul, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I think first of all, I, I agree with, with with Christine and Matt. I think this is this is very relevant. Um, I would say that uh, maybe just to add to that, uh, two things. One is, uh, of course, we don't have unlimited budgets, right? At the same time, I think the budgets still are very very low, right? So our a recent survey, like right, global information security survey, we have actually realized that is less than five per mile. Of the revenues, right? Even I was actually once I was I was presenting this, and the graphic team they actually put five percent because they were so convinced it's five percent. And I said, no, no, it's a hundred times less. So of course it's 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 this. So what I what I what I see is um, uh, there's a little bit of of um, let's say better awareness on the sea level. At the same time, it's it's very difficult sometimes some, for some of the companies to translate security in the business context, and because of that, sometimes the, the you know even the interest that we, we have in the on the sea level is is just like you know, um, uh, you know it's just just like uh, going somewhere right, um, uh, and uh, and what I'm what I think is, is important is invest also in awareness. Um, tabletop tabletop exercises are great. And I think if we can invite C level to that, so they will see what we are talking about, um, that's great. But also, I think the most, most, let's say, the, the biggest investment is the middle management, and it's not only cyber middle management to you know teach them how to talk about cyber to translate this into the money and, and so on and so forth, but also everyone across because the best way to get additional budget is actually to embed cyber security in all the projects. So it should be part of the project rather than just separate budget because we are running into the trap of having oh this is this is a budget you know security so security should be also only funded from cyber and it should be other way around it should be like everyone is responsible for this so everyone should embed this into the budget and this is going and this is actually going um, through awareness I would just say there are some priorities I love the crown jewels I love like what we actually want to protect, but in order to get the, to the, the budget and awareness, I think it's it's the, the, the path for middle management and sea level. Thank you. Cheryl, sure. any last words on the uh, prioritization issue? Yeah, um, the, the, S, the Petronite is operating more than 50 assets uh, nationally and internationally. So uh, we can afford to wait for them to move to uh, start doing the AV patching, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this has to be done centrally. So we get a pool budget from Petronas, get from the Petronas board, uh, convince them this cybersecurity is very important. So we get a pool of money, and then from that money we we go all spend money for all the asset, and we back charge them in time. So by that uh, we get the job done again. Okay. So let's move on to um, a question that Adam really teed up in his introduction, which is supply chain. We can probably all see everybody cringing as I mentioned that. So this has always been a cybersecurity issue, but we've seen a lot of activity around supply chain um, over the last few years. Last year in the United States, just as an example, we had a couple of executive orders from our um, president, which were around um, components from different countries being in, in placed in different systems and causing national, secu national security concerns. Um, and then this year we've had, of course, the fund with SolarWinds, Microsoft Exchange, Kaseya, there's probably about five or 6,000 other supply chain attacks that I'm leaving out. And I'm not even bringing up like ships stuck in the Suez Canal and all the other interesting supply chain issues that we've had this year. Um, this year, we've also had a uh, pres presidential executive order in the United States that the National Institute of Standards and Technology is working on to try to improve supply chain um, or supply software um, security. Uh, so that's not affecting us directly as companies, and that is directed toward the U.S. government. But obviously, a, a vendor that is working in that space probably isn't going to create two different types of software, one to sell to the government and one to sell to us. So we'll probably get some spillover, but that's still a while out. So 
we've got supply chain issues right now. We've had some major attacks this year. What are your, your companies doing to manage supply chain risks right now? And things that you can share with the studio audience here. Don't all talk at one time. <laughs> I think the the focus the, the focus on supply chain is only going to increase. And I think there are a lot of organizations in the supply chain that still feel at this point that it's not their responsibility to um do something about the security of, of, of what they supply into that into that chain. Um, and to that end, I think those organizations that are in a position where they have some handle on what they're doing internally uh, will extend that responsibility down through the supply chain. So uh, as a minimum, for example, and, and everyone here I expect is already doing this and, and, and those watching as well, but from a point of view of traditional audit of who your third parties are, you know, the compliance questionnaire, et cetera. I think it's going to be, be more than just a questionnaire. Uh, it's going to be at least demonstrable evidence of, of you doing that and not just submitting the form and everyone kind of walks away happy. I think there's going to be evidence of that. Um, something like I, I saw on the news this morning that got announced, they're looking at here, they're looking at um, rolling out the cyber assessment uh, framework from the NCSC into the supply chain. Um, I think the overhang from the executive order, um, something that we um, uh, took, uh, uh, made a response and some input on into the Biden administration, um, we'll see more focus on the software bill of materials, what parts are um, in equipment that, and hardware, and how that's installed, and, and everything along the way. I think one of the easiest things an organisation will potentially do is actually give some of that security uh, some of access and some of those systems that they have in-house further down their supply chain to those that potentially don't have the capability to do it or, or can afford the level of security required. Um, so I, I see that sort of, I'll call it extension of the perimeter, but um, it, it, it's not quite like that. But this idea of um, sharing resources for for those in the supply chain that, that can't get to a position uh, in their, on, you know, under their own steam. Sure, maybe you can talk a little bit about supply chain in the ICS OT world. Looks like you're on mute or we're not hearing you. Well, looks like we have some technical difficulties there. Um, Christina Piotr, would you like to... Um, you yeah, back? Of course. Of course. Okay. Uh, shall I be back? Yeah. Maybe, maybe very maybe very quickly. Maybe very quickly. So um couple of things. So supply chain is, is uh, it's a, a deadly, deadly, let's say, uh, weapon because we are you know like with with one um attack we can target really a lot of, of, of companies, right? And what we are seeing is um something that uh, I'll be building maybe a little bit on, on what Matt said, is look at your third party. And a lot of companies just realized that we have a lot of vendors. We have a lot of companies we are working with. And, um, you know, usually when we are choosing vendors, we are choosing them based on functionalities. And security is, well, it's maybe not the, the priority. Today, when we're looking through also the COVID uh, times, uh, security actually is getting more and more important. And what, what, it, what the trend is, even smaller companies, but more nimble, more, let's say, uh, secure, security aware, uh, getting uh, better positioned, uh, even, you know, like uh, above really big companies because of the security reasons. Today in the COVID time, we don't really have time uh, to think about, uh, you know, like if our vendor is, is compliant, I and mean, those vendors need to be compliant full stop, right? We need to test it, we need to check it. But basically, I think uh, leaving the, um, the kind of shortlisting the vendors and uh, based on the security is something that we, I, I'm seeing uh, all the time. And just maybe uh, about OT as well. In terms of industrial control systems, this is a little bit different. But at the same time, 
um, it is a, a trend, right? If you look at the environments, uh, industrial control system environments, um, in, in majority of cases, you have a lot of systems from number of vendors. So this is also one of the things you can start and say like, okay, maybe within 10, maybe within 15 years, but I will have instead of you know, 10 vendors, three vendors, and I will choose them based on security. And this is something that is happening across a number of uh, organization. And I think this is one of the aspects that can be taken into consideration. So, Roll, are you back? Okay. Okay, sorry. There you go. Uh, technical issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, from Petronas, uh, we are worried about these uh, uh, supply chain issues, especially SolarWin was used by our IT department as part of the scanning scanning tool. But uh, we have this standard, ICC 2443 4-1. If you look at the 4-1, it's talking it's talk about uh, uh, supply chain. It's talking about maturity level. So... Uh, from Petras, we just make sure that all the company that's supplying the component, they, sub, they have the certification, maturity level, minimum three we put. And so uh, by that uh, certification, I'm sure those that they are sending, what, they, what, they, what they're supplying is uh, within the maturity level three, and we are okay. Also, at the same time, for dash two for the component, uh, we are supplying, we are specifying, for example, uh, security capable level two. I know this is something a debate people can debate about maybe too high of, of too high of a bar and not many people not many vendor supplier is capable of if you look at the the website i say secure website not many vendor supplier able to sub, able to supply to certify to security capable level two uh, minimum one but that is a standard that patterns is uh looking up and we're gonna put the standard like that even for safeguarding we are gonna put even security level three for example I know uh, not many people or not many vendors is capable of, but uh, that's what we want. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And maybe we all work in a systematic and structured manner. And, and I, I, yeah, it, I, it's very familiar with how we also approach it to um, in Equinor. And I, I tend to, I, I um, have a few years myself in OT, uh, operational actually. And and um, uh, we tried to be innovative there back in the years when I was, and we used sort of the contract. And I see potential for that also in cybersecurity uh, towards a greater extent. And having that said, a use in the contracts um, is a powerful tool, so it needs to be balanced. Uh, so when we were creative in our contracts, um, we also focus on the very close collaboration and having the same safety culture. Uh, so it applies also here on, on cybersecurity to, to sort of work hand in hand and be um, together in, in, in creating that culture and seeing the risks um, uh, collaboratively. So now that we've solved supply chain, we'll move over to the next easy question, which is critical infrastructure. Uh, so obviously this is another area of regulatory fo focus um, uh, across the world, actually. Uh, <clears throat> in the United States, just for, for grins, so we had the Colonial uh, Pipeline ransomware incident. I'm sure most of you have heard about that one. And that's created just a new swath of regulation from a variety of different bodies. Uh, some of it quite prescriptive, uh, but I'll keep my my opinions of it to myself here because there's it's, this is a family panel, so we really don't want to go into those particular details. Um, we also have the uh, the NIS directive in Europe that covers critical infrastructure. Australia, I've, I've heard, has just passed a new mandatory critical um, incident reporting law and is also looking at bring additional information or different uh, requirements on a critical infrastructure going next year. Much of this is focused on the OT systems, which we were just talking about. So there are a couple of questions I would like to throw out to the panel here. One is, is how do you secure your OT systems? And then the $64,000 64, or 64,000 pound question, depending on where you happen to be at this point, um, is you know how do you manage OT and IT within your corporations? Are they in the same group? Are they separate? Do they fight each other? Do they agree, walk with each other? So a little bit about how you manage your OT and, and how your OT, IT and OT systems or system personnel work together. 
So again, free form, anyone free, feel free to jump in. And again, yeah, I won't let me pay you. So before I get into a problem. Pay. Go ahead. Yeah, let me jump in before I get into a problem. Okay. <laughs> um, it is a dated back in 2010. Um, I'm from my in, okay. I am instrument control uh, within the OT, OT environment. Uh, we have these IT guys, uh, uh, Purdue model level 3.5, level 4. We are actually fighting over who is actually taking care of 3.5. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so in 2010, uh, we are doing solo run. Solo, solo means we don't talk to each other. Come to 3, 3.5, okay, up to, uh, we pass the pattern to IT guy. That's not, not, that is not the right way to do. So we realized in 2018, uh, based on our consultant, this is not the right way. It has to be looked from the enterprise level because an attack can happen from the IT side to OT. An attack also can happen from OT to IT. So both will uh, will feel the pain. So we better work as a team. So the it has to be looked at from enterprise level. So which means uh, we need to appoint a captain who will be taking care of both IT and OT. So the captain will lead and those uh, disparate IT OT guy must work together. <laughs> so, so we uh, we we have this culture. Uh, we bring both IT staff and actually OT staff in a single room, for example. Uh, okay. Uh, ironically, when the the leader of the uh, the team was elected from IT, and the project in OT was led also by the IT. So the OT guys, hey, why this? Uh, IT is uh, messing around with our OT. Uh, they, they don't, they, they know nuts about our OT. But the fact is that IT guy has been appointed as a project manager. So we have to cool down our OT, make them understand why, and then we bring them together. Even we bring the IT guy into the room and tell them, okay, when you go to OT, don't mess around with our system because anything that you do will affect HSE. It will affect, uh, the it will trade the plan, it will cause flaring, it will cause people injured and so on and so forth. Because IT, they don't understand about the impact because they are in the in the, in the enterprise side. Uh, they don't uh, get into the HAC so much. So this kind of culture, uh, conditioning, and getting them together, enterprise, looking for enterprise level, uh, it works. Okay, thank you. Others want to jump in? I was just going to say, I mean, it's important to at least get them in the room. Um, I think ultimately they need to be one team. They, they, we just need to get them together permanently. Um, something we've been doing, it, it's a bit different for us because we've obviously with our transition out, out from GE, we had the opportunity to revisit a lot of this from a technology point of view. And we are an organization that has uh, faci you know, facilities and platforms as well as a other business units and an enterprise function. So we've had a lot of uh, HSE-led safety moments that sort of built into a lot of what we do. And, and there's already a lot of integration from the outset. So for, from our point of view, we're probably more converged than a lot of organizations are at this point. Um, the other thing that, that has worked well for us is um, almost taking our OT security expertise and having them as like a center of excellence across the different business units. So um, that's everything from uh, regular um, regular catch-ups with the, the CISO team to working with the other product line businesses when they're developing their products. So everything from security around a product to security of an installation. Um, but what, what seems to be successful is bringing the two together, but it seems to work when the OT side um, starts um, looking after the IT side or, or starts directing the IT side. I've seen it work slightly better there. Um, but again, ultimately, it's about communication, roles and responsibilities. And the, back to that original idea about security being part of the project. So if it's an IT project, getting OT, IT on that project team, security is a, a key milestone in that project. And then understanding around, right, what does that look like? On the OT side, on the IT side, and how does that how does that integrate? So this idea of how can we um, 
we talked about reducing suppliers, but how can we reduce complexi com complexity, simplify um, management consoles, reduce systems, try to manage for, and control everything from, I mean, ideally a single point would be, would be brilliant. You know, this whole single pane of glass thing. I don't know if we'll ever get there really, but it's easier to look in two or three systems than it is to look in 17. And, and having the teams together, learning from each other and that knowledge transfer, I think that that's the, the way forward. Okay. Uh, can I jump in as well? Yes. Please do. Please. So this is, this is entirely my topic. So <laughs> that's why I'm, I'm quick, <laughs> sitting quiet over there. But, um, and, and also I need to uh, kind of explain myself. I, I am engineer. So for the majority of my time, I was actually protecting OT from IT. So sorry about that. But, <laughs> but I think we came, <laughs> so we came to a time and, 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 and honestly, I think the last 12 years really changed a lot, right? So because of lots of reasons, um, I think because of the new safety regulations actually included cybersecurity as well, right? Because we can get to safety system through the cybersecurity. Um, we have everywhere, I think, the safety culture, so we can leverage that. I think this is this is one of the points everyone was saying, oh, actually, this is important. So because it's, it's a part of the safety, let's, let's look at it a little bit closer. That was the first thing. The other thing is, you know, we need to remember that, you know, uh, engineers working on the ground, they, they have their KPIs, they, they, they need to do something over there, they're really, really busy. And uh, by showing sometimes that bringing cybersecurity is bringing this transparency, is bringing this like uh, visibility, but also is helping, for instance, with diagnostics or other stuff, right, is, is really tremendously um, helpful because they are also seeing, also we are seeing, they are also seeing that they can use some of the cybersecurity tools for their own purposes, right? So it's not, you know, additional layers, something that it can, can be really embedded. And I think it works perfectly. Um, so o over here, it's it's better. Uh, goes by, as what I was saying, uh, common teams, understanding, or listening to each other, I think is, is important. But um, I don't know how to say it. Maybe it's a little bit controversial, but I, I think that the time when we eat lunch together and we are agreeing, is not the, I mean, this is not enough, right? It is a, a need for really a new operating model when IT and OT are, are combined. This is at one team. We have some, uh, you know, sort of, of, uh, of ways of impacting uh, OT. And of course, it needs to be like taking the consideration 24-7 uh, and, and, and so on so forth. But it is very difficult sometimes to implement, roll out something, uh, you know, wh while it is not necessary, it is like always like the, the you know, least priority. So I think right now creating operating model, new governance, ITOT governance, using this convergence um, is something that needs to be done formally, not informally. And of course, if IT will come and say, oh, we will do it like this, that's a failure. Um, it needs to be like um, those two those two teams. And I think what is important, those two teams not one person from OT and 20 people from IT, because this is a usual thing I, I see, but actually like, you know, balance it to make sure that, uh, you know, like they, they have really a voice uh, in, in, in this room, right? So um, this is it. And, and maybe from the perspective of um, uh, projects that are usually uh, working with, with uh, two teams, network segmentation separation, you cannot do it without like both teams uh, implementing uh, asset OT asset management and further OT SOC, so like IT and OT SOC, incident response throughout the organization, impossible without OT team because you will still need to go back to OT team when something is happening. So there are some things that will require um, collaboration, but I think, unfortunately, this needs to be now formal. Thank you. And great. Yeah, great comments um, from all of you. A practical example from Equinor. Um, looks maybe in, in practical terms uh, much the same as you said, Sharu, when you put the same people, when you put the different people in, in the same room. Um, what we've done is that we have uh, created a business, um, an area of our business consisting of uh, around 2000 people uh, out of the 22,000 that we are. Uh, which is called TDI, Technology, Digital and Innovation. And they are really Equinor's uh, powerhouse and, and at the heart of, um, 
of technology, digital and innovation. And OT is sort of invited to the party there through cross culture, uh, through cross um, um, uh, functional teams and, 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 and um, bringing in uh, different parts of um, our company. So our focus has been on operationalizing the same as you've said uh, through the different teams and in every aspects of the work and that we do on technical digital and innovation so um, but it, it, it's a tough one I have to admit that um, it, it's it's two worlds and and also you probably want to touch upon this Michael going forward but the speed of um, that we've just been in is, is, is so fast. So to be at pace with that in, in the IT and OT world and to merge the two is, um, we foresee that that's the future, but to, to get there in practical terms is something that we have to work on. Yeah, so I'll throw out a couple of, so firstly, I'm the IT guy on the, on this panel. So don't throw things at me at the moment. Um, so I'm the one that caused your systems to crash and the ones that caused all those sorts of problems. Um, one of the things that was kind of interesting about 2001, I was at a conference where we were talking about uh, process control or DCS, skater or whatever they were calling it back at that time, uh, security. And it was kind of an interesting group. We had a bunch of engineers from one of the companies there and a bunch of IT folks. Uh, so it was operations for, it was basically OT versus IT in the room. And the first morning was just really, really contentious where the OT folks said the IT folks didn't know what we were talking about. IT returned the favor. And then we had a, uh, a kind of a group exercise where they paired an IT person with an OT person. And we were supposed to list the highest risks or concerns that we had about an operating environment. And the oddity was that um, I think we listed the top 10 uh, I was paired with an OT guy, and I think the first five that we had put on there pretty much agreed. Uh, he may have been looking at it from a safety standpoint. I might have been looking from a cyber standpoint, but a cyber system that crashes and causes a safety incident, that's kind of where we kind of merged together. And once we went through that exercise, we had a lot of cooperation the rest of the day uh, because what we kind of realized were that we may be coming at from different perspectives, uh, but we all had the same goal in mind at the end. And that's why a lot of y'all were talking about. If you get people in the same room, not just eating lunch together, really having to look at problems, you're gonna realize there's a lot more in common that you have um, than you might have otherwise expected when we were knocking systems out with pings and other uh, and other things that were going on back in the day. Um, the other thing that we did in Chevron, uh, which helped bring the groups together, was uh, my boss at the time, this is somewhere around 2005, 2006, so it was a long time ago, uh, a little bit after the session that we actually was talking about, took someone, moved somebody from the operations area into the IT security group. And this person became our liaison to the OT group. And so the OT folks trusted him because he was one of them. And we trusted him because he was one of us. And so he became that bridge between both organizations. And we kept that position in line for a while. Now, actually, our OT and IT folks are in the same organization reporting up to the CISO. So there's a little less need. We actually, I can actually name folks on the OT side by, by, by name now and actually know how to talk with them. So, um, which was a lot more than I could have done 20 years ago. But that, that's a nice way. So if you haven't gotten to the point where you're all t together yet and you're looking for some way to bridge those two groups together, uh, all liaison position might be something to go. I, I thought I cut somebody off there just a moment ago, but, or did I? Someone wanted to Not add something to this? Okay. Yep. Oh, we're getting down. Go ahead. No, I was just saying. Close. Little... Go ahead. Please. Okay. I was about to say this. Uh, putting the OT guy in the IT. What about putting the IT guy in the OT? Work, works the same way. Um, it's just the idea is that you have somebody who um, the other side trusts. And what it does is give you a bridge between the two groups. Um, and, and again, a lot of this, it's, it's just, and once you build that bridge up, then you have other, you end up with more interactions and other things occur that allow you to make the groups more integrated over time. Uh, but that first step, because up until that point, we, all the IT folks had no reason to talk to the OT folks because IT was IT and nobody knew what I, you know, OT was running all those old systems that were not patched and therefore they were, you know, completely wrong and we were completely right. And OT was coming, you know, looking at us and saying, well, we don't know what the hell we're doing because we're, we're making money for the company. The OT is making money for the company 
and the IT folks are just you know you know spending spending money because that they're a call center, uh, and so you have that just dynamic that there's no no common ground. When in reality is, as y'all all astutely pointed out, you, know, you can attack OT from IT and, and vice versa. And so if you're attacked through IT and the OT goes down, that's a common problem um, because now, now you're not making money and the problem came from the IT side. They lost money over that. They had to pay a ransom. Not, and they caused a lot of problems in the Southeast U.S. with gasoline and a lot of bad publicity over that. So there's a case where the two group, I'm not saying the two groups didn't work together. There's an example where one influenced the other. So we're getting close to the witching hour for this particular panel. Uh, we got about six minutes left if my uh, timing calculations are correct. So I wanted to open it up to y'all to give you know, maybe one takeaway that you would want to leave the audience with. Uh, so each of you probably has a couple of minutes here to, um, to talk about that. So Christine, why don't you go ahead and start? Yeah, so uh, my focus would be to to train uh, the organization and, and to protect our organization, as I said, through the defining whatever the crown jewels are. Um, and and actually, in order to engage people, and there's also a war for over attention, there's, there's information overload going on at the moment. So um, in order to, to really take um, cybersecurity home into your roles and into your responsibility, um, I'm a firm, firm believer in, in taking it into also your personal lives to understand your risk um, also there. Uh, so you, obviously you need to invest in, in competence development and, and um, ensuring that um, no matter what your role are, you have to understand your risk, whatever you are protecting, and how you can contribute um, towards making your organization more secure. Um, so I, you have to see yourself in that um, and, and, and make that impact, whether you're a leader, employee, uh, or even actually as a parent, uh, we have to enable each other uh, to protect ourselves and uh, our families. Yotter? Right, so uh, I, th I think uh, we are on the verge of, of uh, very interesting times because um, we haven't maybe touched on this, but um, cybersecurity or cyber threats were usually not that aggressive. But if you look right now at the ransomware and the ransomware, let's say, the, 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 the volume, let's say, um, Colonia was 4 million. But one week ago, there was a first ransomware attack successful um, and the, the ransom was $200 million, right? So right now, I think we will have a groups, specialized groups for ransomware attacks. And if you look at the dark web, uh, you know, like maybe you will see that, but basically after a colonial, there's a saying that if you are targeting a company with OT, it necessarily, not necessarily needs to be OT targeted attack. It can be IT that will potentially impact the, the OT. The, the probability of, of getting the ransom is very, very high. So what you can, we can probably anticipate is having specialized uh, team, teams of, of, uh, of attackers, of hackers, um, and the ransomware attacks on the OT infrastructure or IT with, with, uh, with let's say, influence of OT with a very big, big, big money. When there's a big money, there's a big business. So I think today it's like, we will probably one year from now think about a completely different landscape. And because of that, I think uh, security should be treated as a you know, part of the business, cost of the business. Um, it's something like, you know, utility, like a water or, or electricity, something like that. And we should say like, nobody of us will, will drive a car without the seatbelts. So nobody will, will, will run the company without the security. And I think this change in the perception of security as a, a cost of running business is, is very important because everyone likes their company and they want to protect the company. And I think this should be just say, security is, 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 a, is a consequence of that. So this is my, I think my one, one take. Okay, Carol. Okay. okay, for my last uh, is about this. Um, the strongest link is the weakest link. Okay, so which means 
you can do so many things you can fortify strengthen but you forgot one small thing the thing can come in example is the easy attack is the uh, uh, uh the fishing fishing okay so fishing is very easy people can just click right right now every day people clicking so they clicking and clicking and one day the attachment comes together with a virus so that gets into our system because we are all interconnected so that is very risky and very scary so at the same time now i am uh, advocating uh, the standards and uh, the OT cyber cyber standard IEC 6443 among uh, Malaysian uh, industry and because they are surrounding Petronas they are suppliers to Petronas so if they are not up to date with Petronas I think they are also the willing so the letter the letter attack can, can can come in so my priority right now is also to strengthen the surrounding thank you okay Matt so I think as a lot of the discussion here we talked about how to to get people work different teams working together so my my takeaway is integration so integration of people and teams but also integration of a lot of organizations tend to select particular point products to solve a problem and thinking about how those are going to work together as well as working with what already has been invested in on the it side and and trying to simplify the management uh, and control and management of risk around that so a lot of um, a lot of problems are looked at in isolation. So you know, someone buys a firewall and then they they buy a visibility tool separately and haven't really th thought about how the two are going to communicate to each other. Because I think the hardest thing um, an organisation will will do in that in delivery of that project is is trying to solve that problem and and the, the knowledge it takes and the time it takes to make stuff to get work together because until it all works together we, do you truly get the context that allows you to make the right decisions at the right time uh, so my takeaway is, is thinking about how how it can all integrate together thank you folks uh, at this point i'd like to thank the panelists for their contributions normally i'd ask the audience to give you the uh, congratulations as well so just imagine that there, there are hundred thousand or two hundred thousand folks on the call right now giving you a standing ovation so uh, thank you for your time thank you folks for listening to us um and adam i'll turn it back over to you <laughs>